good evening or uh, good afternoon or whatever it happens to be in uh, your part of the world. Uh, my name is Magnus Hagender. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, Postgres and specifically about uh, the new Postgres version 13. Uh, first, a few quick words about myself. As I said, my name is Magnus Hagender. I work for a company called Red Pill Linpro. We're an uh, open source services and consultancy business that's based in Scandinavia. And uh, I'm in Stockholm in Sweden myself. Uh, and uh, working for uh, Red Pill Impro as our uh, lead on the database side focused on Postgres. Uh, I also do a lot of things in the Postgres community, which is not uh, technically as a part of the work. I'm a member of the Postgres core team, so the steering committee for the product. Uh, I'm one of the committers uh, on the project, and I'm currently serving as president of the board for Postgres Europe, which is our uh, advocacy organization within Europe. Um, but enough about me and let's talk about Postgres. And as I said, let's talk about Postgres version 13. <clears throat> so before I pick up any questions on the topic, uh, yes, we did release Postgres version 13 and we are well aware that the number 13 is you know, superstitious in uh, certain parts of the world. Uh, but given that Postgres is a global project that exists all over the world, if we avoided every number that people are superstitious about, it would be very hard to put out any releases of software at all. So uh, Postgres 13 uh, carries no special meaning except it's the version after number 12, and it will be the version before number 14. Now, if you look at how Postgres 13 happened, it actually started, so the work on Postgres 13 started in July of last year uh, when we branched off version 12, which was then released in September of last year. Uh, now, the way that we work uh, in Postgres development is that all new feature development happens on the main or the master branch. And then at some point in time, we basically decide that we're done with a version. We create a branch for that release. We name it. So for in this case, in July 2019, we released uh, Postgres 12. Well, we didn't release it in July. Uh, we branched it in July and then we created a branch called uh, version 12 stable. And, and, you know, magically version 12 was now stable. Well, I mean, at, at this point is when we considered version 12 to be stable, uh, we were only going into bug fix mode on version 12. Uh, and the important thing, I mean, we were basically in just bug fix mode ahead of that as well. The important thing that happened in July 2019 was as the 12 branch was created, that means that the master branch or the main branch was opened for new development of features into what would then eventually uh, become Postgres version 13. Uh, the way that we work with development in Postgres is we use something that we call commit fests. Uh, it's really just our way of, of saying how we do iterative development, where the basic idea is we spend one month doing feature development and you know, creating code, creating patches, <clears throat> and then we spend one month of reviewing this code and, and getting it committed to uh, the main branch or merged in or, or whichever term you choose to use. And then we run these uh, a number of times. So for Postgres version 13, the first uh, commit fest was run in July, and then we ran one in September, one in November, another one in January, and then one in March. And basically at the end of this March commit fest, we entered a feature freeze uh, for Postgres version 13. So Postgres version 13 hit feature freeze uh, in March 2020. And then we spent the, uh, the rest of the spring and the summer, you know, as we all did uh, working from home in stabilizing. We put out uh, beta versions, we put out release versions, and eventually uh, in September of 2020, we put out the release of what became uh, Postgres 13. But the feature set was mostly known at the end of March uh, when this commit fest number five closed. In theory, uh, after that, nothing new can be added. That's more than in theory, nothing new can be added. But in theory, things can be removed. Even in some versions, we've even had fairly major features removed after the feature freeze. Uh, I don't think we had any major features removed in version 13. So if you were testing one of the earlier versions, uh, it is probably the same as it was then. So let's look at a few of the things that Postgres 13 adds. Uh, I do these talks for every version of Postgres and I try to just a little bit break them up into sections and, and my uh, recurring uh, breakup is uh, I talk about DBA and admin features, SQL and developer, then specifically about backup and replication, uh, and then a few words about new features around the area of performance. Of course, what's the real difference between a DBA 
and a developer today, like in a modern organization, this is in a, this is a very overlapping roles, but uh, I've just basically decided to say, well, I'm going to put the things that are not exposed at the SQL level first, and then I make a separate section for the things that are exposed at the SQL level. Uh, so let's start with some of the really important functionality, right? I'm sure you've all at some point wanted to run, you know, get rid of something and run the command drop database, right? Uh, and we've always had it, well, we've had it for a long time, the ability to drop a database. Uh, we've enhanced it with now the ability to automatically disconnect users, because I'm sure you've all at some point tried this, right? Intentionally or not, you know, drop database production. And what happens when you do that is basically it hangs, right? And the reason that it hangs is that you have users connected to the database and you cannot drop the database while somebody is using it. So Postgres 13 gives you now the ability to just say drop database with force and then it will, you will get rid of production real quick. Now, this is an excellent way to test your backups. Um, hopefully, if your database is actually named production, you will hopefully not do this by mistake, but you know, given the names, uh, it certainly can't happen. But it can be interesting in particular, uh, maybe not for the production database, but for like CI and CD databases where you might have you know, scripts that are interfering and you just want to get rid of it in order to reprovision it to run the next round of tests. Obviously a very small feature. Uh, there are not that many breaking changes in Postgres 13. Uh, some Postgres versions have had major breaking changes. Most of them have very few. Uh, Postgres 10 was probably the last one that had a lot of breaking changes where it broke uh, many DBA scripts and, and backup scripts and things by renaming a bunch of things. So uh, Postgres 13 is back at renaming a number of things. Uh, in particular, most wait events have been renamed. Uh, the majority of them have, have been given new names. <clears throat> the advantage here is they're more consistent now, and we will hopefully not get the idea of renaming them, them again, but it was clear that over the versions that have sort of collected new uh, wait events in each version to monitor, uh, there wasn't really a consistency in how they were named, and, and now it's a lot more consistent. Uh, of course, depending on how you are monitoring your wait events, this may break your monitoring tools, right? Uh, because they're, the, the events are still there, but they have a different name. If your monitoring solution automatically picks up the new names, you're fine. Well, it'll just work. But if not, then you might need to dig into it. Uh, and another thing that will probably break a bunch of things is that at all the timing columns, if you're using the pgstat statements extension, and if you're not using pgstat statements, you really should be using pgstat statements. But all the timing, like total time, has been renamed to total exec time. Min, min time has been renamed to min exec time, things like that. So anything that collects this data, which is what you're probably doing, will uh, need to deal with the fact that these are renamed. I'll get into later why they have been renamed, uh, because, of course, there's an actual reason for it as well. Uh, but looking then into a few of these features. So what do we have? New features around the area of DBA and administration. Uh, first thing I'll mention is we are now able to do to change the statistics target on extended statistics. So Postgres collects statistics in two different ways. By default it collects statistics on every column uh, and you can then using the uh, alter table command you can change how much statistics it collects on each column. But then you can create this thing called extended statistics which is where you say create statistics and you say collect statistics on the combination of two columns. Uh, and previously, you couldn't actually control the amount of statistics collected on the combination, separately from the underlying columns. You could still configure it on the underlying columns, but not on the combination. Uh, now with the wonderful command, it's alter statistics set statistics. Uh, you can now change it. So in this case, I've created an extended statistics called foo. I can now set the statistics collection factor to 1,000, where the default is 100 to have it collect more data. Uh, now these extended statistics can really help with specific types of queries. So if you haven't looked into how they work in general, uh, it's certainly something that it, I would recommend that you take a look at and see what happens. Um, the analyze command has now received a progress view. So we've seen over the past couple of versions of Postgres how a number of utility commands uh, like vacuum, like create index, have got a use called PG stat progress something uh, and analyzes the next one in, which will basically show you that as an analyze is running, whether it's running in the background from AutoVacuum or running manually, this view will tell you how far ahead it is so that you can track how much is left uh, to be done on it. And you just query the, the view and you'll get back one row for each currently running uh, analyze command, regardless of where it came from. 
Uh, speaking of vacuum, regular vacuum now has received the ability to run in parallel or it, it runs partially parallel. You can say vacuum parallel on a table. Uh, the main vacuum process in this will still run serially just like before. Uh, but in most cases, that's not actually the part that takes the longest time. The part that takes the longest time is vacuuming the related indexes on the table. And that's the part that now gets parallelized if you say vacuum parallel. Uh, of course, we, as with all those things, if you start parallelizing it, it's going to consume more of your resources. So you may or may not want to do it depending on, on uh, how much uh, sort of free performance overhead uh, you have available in your system. But it gives you a chance to get your vacuums to finish quicker if you are in the position where you need vacuum to run really fast. Now, hopefully your system is more balanced so that you can have your auto vacuum handle most of the vacuuming in the background, in which case uh, this should hopefully not be needed. Uh, and speaking of auto vacuum, uh, there's an important addition to auto vacuum. Uh, auto vacuum in uh, previous versions of Postgres would be triggered by uh, updates. It would be triggered by uh, deletes. And analyze would be triggered by inserts. Now, this would lead to if you have a table that's basically insert only, so you only insert data into it, then an actual vacuum would never run on this table. We'd still analyze it to collect the statistics. But we'd not run vacuum until you ran uh, to the point where we'd run one of these anti wraparound vacuums or freeze vacuums. Uh, the problem with this was well, number one, once you got to this level, uh, running this vacuum would be very expensive and very slow. And it's often with the modern Postgres versions, it's better to run more frequent but cheaper vacuums. Uh, but the other thing is for the index only scans to work in Postgres, a table must be vacuum. Right? Vacuum sets the flag in the visibility map that the index only scan uses. So if you had an insert only table, you would never get index only scans on it, which is uh, obviously a bad thing because an insert only table is often a use case where you can need that. Uh, so we now have the ability to trigger auto vacuum by inserts as well. It collects two separate uh, configuration parameters, auto vacuum vacuum insert scale factor and insert threshold. They work the same as the other scale factors and thresholds for auto vacuum except of course it's uh, triggered by inserts and not by updates and deletes and things. And by default, this is uh, turned on. So it will run by default, but depending on your workload, uh, you may need to tune these uh, parameters to make it maybe run uh, these insert based vacuum even more frequently. Or if you have a use case where it turns into be a problem, you can turn it down uh, and have it run less frequently. Uh, but these are another uh, set of, of sort of further improvements of the vacuum handling in Postgres, which can be critical to uh, getting your system to run really well. Uh, if you are logging slow queries, in general, uh, I'm personally in favor of, of, you know, as far as it works, use pgstat statements instead, uh, because it gives you a lot, uh, lot of really interesting information. But there are things you can do with logging that you can't really do with pgstat statements, in particular things like collecting actual instances, uh, pgstat statements will normalize your queries. Sometimes you want them non-normalized. Now, the general problem that we always have if we log all our slow queries is that we end up logging so much that now every query is slow and, and we're stuck in this downward spiral. So the slow query sampling is really a replacement of the parameter log mean duration statement. Uh, log mean duration statement is still there. Uh, but log mean duration statement will log every query that takes longer than a certain amount of time. Now with slow query sampling, you can, for example, set log mean duration sample to 100 milliseconds and then log statement sample rate to 0 0.1. In this case, for every, we will log one in every 10 queries that take longer than 100 milliseconds. So it's just a way to cut down the amount of queries that we log in order to not overload the system. Now, as I said, log mean duration statement is still there and it keeps working independently. So if you were to actually also set log mean duration statement to 100 milliseconds, it would just log everything. Right? Uh, but you might want to set something like uh, log mean duration sample to 100 milliseconds and then uh, log mean duration statement to a second or five seconds or something like that, which will uh, then give these a separate. So you're saying between 100 milliseconds and one second, I want to log one in every 10 queries. But if it goes above one second, log all of them. So it gives you the ability to, uh, to control these independently and, and to get this detailed logging without uh, overflowing your system with too much logging. Uh, there are numerous changes in Postgres 13 around the topics of SSL. A lot of them just have to do with bringing the SSL support 
up to the latest versions and being able to control it more. Uh, one important note is that Postgres now defaults to TLS version 1.2. Uh, you can still lower this if you, for example, have clients that can't speak TLS version 1.2. You can go into the Postgres configuration and change the minimum protocol version away down to, say, maybe TLS version 1.0, which used to be the default. Uh, and you can also set a maximum version if, if you have an actual reason for that. I don't really know what it would be. Uh, also, in versions prior to version 13, you could only configure this on the server side. Version 13 adds the uh, mirrored parameters on the client side, so you can go into your connection string and say connect to this server minimum protocol version TLS 1.2, for example, to make sure that you're not exposed to any form of downgrade uh, attacks by a rogue server or a, a rogue mid middleman in there somewhere. Um, the Postgres foreign data wrapper, so for connecting um, foreign tables to a different Postgres server, has learned to use SSL authentication as well. So it can use, uh, you can specify a key and a certificate uh, in the user mapping. So instead of saying, when this user is connecting, use this username and password, you can instead say, use this SSL information uh, to go ahead. Uh, you can also now specify that you can do passwordless connections with Postgres foreign data wrapper to, for example, use a GSS API connection or a peer connection uh, for logging in one Postgres server into another. Unfortunately, we still don't support uh, GSS delegation. So it will still be, if you're using GSS, for example, it will still be the Postgres server logging into the other server, not the end user. Uh, but it can still be very useful uh, information to not have to deal with uh, usernames and passwords in, in server to server authentication. Uh, we've completed our systems with more statistics uh, for your monitoring. There is now a view called PTStack SLRU which contains statistics about uh, something we call SLRU structures. These are uh, exact values, sub-transactions, multi-exact. They basically give you more IO statistics of objects that we previously did not uh, collect IO statistics on. In the PG stat activity view, which is where uh, we collect information about all running queries, there is now a new column called leader PID, uh, which can be used to correlate. Uh, if your query is running in parallel query, it will, the leader PID of each worker running the query will have the PID of the regular backend that is running the query. Because previously, if you had multiple parallel queries running at the same time, there was really no way to correlate which worker was actually working together with which uh, user connection, for example. Uh, this new leader PID will uh, let you do that. Uh, and it will then, of course, be set to null if this is not a parallel query, in which case, you know, there is no information about who the parallel leader is. Uh, the final thing to mention in the area of DBA and uh, administration is uh, what, I call, what we call trusted extensions, which is basically extensions that can be installed as a non-super user. So previously, you would require a super user to say, create extension. In Postgres 13, you don't anymore, as long as this is a trusted extension. Uh, so what is a trusted extension? Well, it's anything that the extension author says is trusted. Uh, but the idea is that, that it must not install or, or you know, open up something uh, that becomes a security vulnerability if you let a regular user install it. Uh, so many of the built-in ones have been changed to be this. Uh, for example, the PG Crypto one, which is a popular extension to install, you can now install that without being super user. Uh, the B3 GIST or Interace, which are plugin modules to be able to index uh, new types of data or, or use new data types. Uh, a lot of these are uh, now installable by default. Obviously, this is just the create extension command. Somehow you need to get the binary onto the system. You need to install the RPM or Debian package or something. And that part obviously still requires administrative privileges on the server level. It just doesn't require the, the two level administration uh, anymore. Uh, so moving up the stack a little bit, talking about SQL and developer side, there are actually unusually few of these, but some are really useful uh, that are coming up in this version that I choose to highlight. Um, one of them is the simple fact that UUIDs, as we all know how to work, uh, generation of UUIDs in Postgres has previously required an extension uh, using a special library. Uh, now the generation of random UUIDs, which covers most use cases, right, have been moved into core Postgres. So you can now just say gen random UUID and you'll get a, a random UUID. Right? <clears throat> Obviously, nothing changes in the cases where you are generating the UUIDs in the application and just storing them. Just remember to use the UUID data type uh, and everything will keep working. 
Uh, Postgres 12 added JSON path support, uh, but it did not add support for JSON path date times. Uh, I believe that was the only part that was actually missing. Uh, Postgres 13 adds it. So it basically means that you can use the dot to date time function uh, inside of JSON, given the fact that JSON itself does not support date times. This is a way to perform date time comparisons of values that are date times, but they're stored as strings because it's in JSON. Um, I don't think it's a, a massively big feature, but I believe that's the only part of JSON path that Postgres previously didn't have, uh, and it has it now, right? So that's all good. Uh, we've added support for fetch first with ties. Uh, now, anyone who knows standard SQL knows that the way to do, uh, to limit the size of your result set is using the fetch first n rows syntax. Uh, if we're from the Postgres world or maybe from the MySQL world, we're used to saying things like limit and offset, but the SQL standard way of doing that is fetch first. Um, and the difference here in the fetch first with ties, so um, as you see in the first query here, which just fits on the screen, uh, see we select select star from n order by one fetch first two rows only it'll give me the first two rows in this table right? and it's ordered by uh, the i in this case but what i don't know here is whether there is another row with the same value of the order by column uh, and the way that this one does which of course now ended up being right outside the screen but the second query is select star from n order by i fetch first two rows with ties. That says fetch the first two rows and then fetch any other rows that has the same value for the order by column uh, as the first two. So in this case, it would get me both the twos if the table had two of them in there. It's not a huge feature, but there are a lot of really good use cases for actually knowing whether there are more values uh, or more rows with the same value uh, still in the table. Uh, so, Moving on, looking a little bit at the area of backup and replication. Uh, again, there is another one of these progress views, just like we had a progress view for analyze. We now also have a PG stat progress base backup that if you are using PG base backup, it'll give you a progress report. How far along is your backup? Uh, that's simple. That's really all there is to it. Uh, it requires that progress reporting is enabled. Therefore, the default has been changed to enable uh, progress reporting. You can still turn it off if you don't want it. Uh, but the default is now that it is on and thereby uh, it is available. Uh, we've introduced a standard format for backup manifests uh, and it is included in base backups by default when you take them with PG base backup. Uh, a backup manifest is basically a, a structured file that has a list of the contents of your backup and checksums of what they should look like. And along with this comes a new tool called PG Verify Backup. Now, if you're using one of the tools to manage your backup, say PG Backrest or, or Barman, they already did similar things. Like there, you have the ability to validate in these tools, but the built-in tools did not have this. Uh, and now, of course, there is a standardized version uh, of this manifest file format that other tools uh, can use as well. Because it turns out it's surprisingly common that the backups are just fine when you take them and then they get like the disk that stores the backups end up being corrupt. And it's really hard to figure out where it broke. Now this will at least tell you that the, the breakage, the corruption is in the backups themselves. Of course, you still have corrupt backups, that's a problem, but at least now you know where they were. Uh, Postgres logical replication uh, added in version 10 has now been properly married with the use of uh, the new style partitioned tables. As previously, you couldn't actually replicate partition tables uh, with logical replication, you could still with physical. In Postgres 13, you can uh, now replicate your logical, uh, logically replicate your partition tables. Uh, it will still replicate, so if you have a table with 10 partitions, it'll replicate them as 10 separate replication uh, points. You can decide to publish it individually, which would be the default, and then those go into 10 partitions that look exactly the same on the other side. Or you can say publish via partition route and all the updates will look like they came from the master table rather than from the partitions. And along with this, we also have the ability to receive data into partition tables. Um, we have a new parameter that limits the use of disk space for replication slots called max while slot keep size. Uh, if you create replication slots for Postgres, it will uh, keep data around forever, basically. Uh, and this could lead you to running your primary service out of disk space. By setting this, you put a limit saying, keep data up to this point. If we're not keeping it, uh, or if you hit this point, then just break the replication. Because at some point, like you, you have to make a choice. And this 
gives you the ability to make the choice saying, I want to keep my primary server up. Uh, final note about replication is you can now reconfigure your primary connection information without restarting Postgres, which means you can take a standby node, point it to a new IP address, for example, of your primary node without having to restart it, thereby without having to stop queries or connections that are running on the standby node. So as we draw towards the end of this talk, uh, let's talk about a few things around performance, which I'm sure everybody always wants, right? Postgres 13 adds something called incremental sort, which is a way to optimize multi-level sort. Like when you are sorting by two columns, uh, the thing that Postgres can use now is the fact that a lower level of the query might be sorted by one column, which is not the full sort that you need at the top higher level of the query to, to satisfy what's needed there, but it's partially sorted at which point it can now split this upper level sort into buckets and only sort them individually because it knows that the data that's coming up from the lower level, which may be say an index scan, but only on one of the columns and not all of them um, that it needs at the topper level, uh, it can sort them individually, thereby requiring a lot less resources to do this sorting, which may then be the sorting that delivers your reply, uh, or it may be sorting that just delivers input to yet another level uh, uh, of the query plan. So this is not something that should affect you in any way other than you know, queries should run faster. Uh, we have the ability for disk-based hash aggregates. Uh, previously, Postgres has always been able to, uh, if it doesn't have enough memory to do a sort, it will do it on a disk. Uh, whereas if it had to do a hash operation, it couldn't, it would just use it in memory. Uh, so this means we can now use hash for group buys and for distincts and for grouping sets, even in cases where workmem is not enough. And it will also help us in the case that if we have a really bad estimate, uh, Postgres would actually uh, if you choose to do a hash-based group by, for example, and the estimate was really bad, it would just keep allocating memory until uh, our good friend, the OOM killer, would start killing processes. Uh, so this will make hash aggregates useful uh, in a bunch of more places. Uh, we've generally added uh, the ability to do WAL usage tracking, which adds, as you can see here in the explain, analyze, comma, WAL. You will now get information about how much transaction log was generated by this. This is obviously for a write query. So we're saying here, uh, explain, analyze, comma, while, well, insert into, and you can see there are a couple of rows down, it says while well, records one bytes 59. This is a way to track exactly how much uh, transaction log is being generated. Um, PGStat statements has gained the ability to do this while usage tracking. Uh, and the main thing it's also got, it now has planner statistics, which is why all of these columns were renamed, right? So other than just having these execution times, it now also adds total plan time, minimum plan time, maximum plan time, mean plan time, and standard deviation of plan times. Uh, and again, along with the while records and FBIs and bytes uh, broken down per query. So this is the core reason why these were renamed is that so that we're able to also track the planning time. Uh, final feature to mention, uh, deduplication of B trees, which is basically if you have an index with a lot of duplicates, um, this uh, feature will give you significantly smaller indexes and thereby much improved uh, performance. Uh, it's fairly common cases in uh, to have a lot of duplicates, might not be at the end of the, you might have um, duplicates at certain levels of the index. And it's basically a way to store and query this data in a much more compact way. Instead of storing every value, uh, or instead of storing the same value many times, it'll store it once and basically say how many times it's there. So. Uh, this can be a very efficient way of, of reducing the size of the indexes and thereby increasing scan time and cache hit ratios uh, for these things. Now, there's always a lot of more features. Uh, when you talk about a new versions, there are hundreds of things going into each version of Postgres, many smaller fixes, a lot of performance improvements. Uh, there's no way uh, to mention all of them. Uh, therefore, I'm going to stop at this point. Uh, I am going to uh, try to hang around in the Slack channel and uh, see if I can answer any questions that you have there. Otherwise, you're always free to contact me on Twitter, for example, or uh, just come uh, join us in the Postgres community and talk about Postgres. Okay, thank you very much.